morning, everybody. Everybody's well. Happy Friday. Oh, man. Um, just as a reminder, we'll be off Monday and Tuesday this week. We have a the Momentum Retreat for those who have been talking about it. So I will see you on Wednesday with God's help. Um, we've been talking about this concept of the wall, the energy that we have to get through the wall and the choices we make once we're at the wall. Yesterday, I was, I was telling you, for those who saw the show, if not, you got to check it out. Um, go to shabacho.com. Um, I ha- interviewed a woman named Orna Klein. She's a Mossad agent. Fascinating woman. Really phenomenal. And um, in the show, we only got a couple minutes of her. But if you go to the website, I hope that they've already put up the full interview with her. She explained to me like the real, the behind the scenes of being a Mossad agent. You know, we think the Mossad, I think every most, I, we, I interviewed two Mossad agents yesterday for the show. One, a commando. The, the show was, I mean, God bless Yaakov Ginniger and Yossi Freeman and the whole team. We had the, one of the top commanders in the Entebbe raid, one of the Mossad agents who was like the world's expert on the Eichmann capture, and this lady, Orna, who was very involved in the 1981 I- Iraqi nuclear real, uh, reactor bombing. Both of them, the, the two Mossad agents, as soon as I got on, said, you know, tell me something about the Mossad. Um, it's not what you, the first thing, it's not what you think. <laughs> like, it's, it's not what you think. Like, you know, like the whole, like James Bond jumping out of the airplane, you know, while he's shooting the enemy, as he lands on the, mo- on the motorcycle, as he drives, like, you know, that whole thing. Eh, it's not actually, that's not how we roll. We're Jews. That's not our, that's not our, our, our superpower. And they each began to explain what, you know, are the ways in which it really works. And if you listen closely and we could talk about that, I guess, from another show, but like, it's fascinating. There's one thing that she said that was so interesting about what it's like to be in the Mossad, which is, you know, they would send her to countries for weeks at end to collect information on people, on, on threats. And she would every day, like do her thing, you know, she'd be a tourist and she would at night have to go and find these places and collect information, whatever she was doing. But during the day, she had to act like a tourist, but she had to disappear. She couldn't be around. It's amazing. And she explained how to do that. How do you disappear in in plain sight? The clothes you wear, how you engage people, how you, where you put your eyes. One, she said to me, fascinating. She said, in one case in Switzerland, Switzerland apparently is like a police state. I didn't know this, but if you cross the street, you get like a ticket. I think that's officially a rule in other places too, but like they actually enforce it. So there was a Mossad agent that was in Switzerland that got arrested because he crossed the street, not on, on red. You understand? Like he's like an Israeli. He's like, I got to wait for like the red. <laughs> like, are you out of your mind? Like it's, I don't know, crossing the middle. A guy in his balcony saw him, called the cops. The cops were down the block. They, they arrested him. The whole thing got blown. We're crossing the street. Yeah. Same like, you have, to dis- you have to disappear. And what she, one of the things that I asked her was like, you know, what are some of the traits? And she said, People think that in order to be in the Mossad, you have to not be afraid. It's not true. I was always afraid. Fear is part of what you have to help you be better. Fear is a normal reaction to circumstances that you can use for your advantage to accomplish your goals. You're always scared. You get used to that tension. And then she said, I don't know if it was her or somebody else, but one of them said, oh, I think it was the other one. I think it was Avner who said, um, you get used to tension so much that when you don't have it, you miss it. And I asked him this question because he said to me, like, almost like, off, you know, backhandedly. Yeah, when I was 19, they dropped me into a small town north of Beirut for a month. And I'm like, they did what? And he said, that was the best month of my life. I'm like, what'd you say? Like, that's the, what, getting dropped alone into enemy territory is the best month. Like, what, how do you have fun? That doesn't sound like very fun to me. And what he was getting at was, you get into this way, you start to appreciate what tension is. You start to appreciate these things. 
And you don't reject them. You use them. You start to realize that they're powerful emotions. We spoke about this like a month ago, the use of emotions. We're at the wall together for the past few days. And at the wall of our lives, we f have emotions. These emotions are there to help us, to make us better. The fear that we have is, is, is an emotion that can be channeled to becoming more successful. Being brave doesn't mean not having fear. It means acting while having fear. Do you know how many people that I meet that are in the public eye that say to me that they're nervous when they get up to speak? More than not, people wouldn't know it. They just keep on going, even though they have fear. That's how it works. So when we all hit that wall that, we, that we've been speaking about, we have to all know that we all have got a wall. That's how it works. That's how life works. If you don't got a wall, what are you doing here? If everything's figured out, you're just not playing hard enough. I was on the phone yesterday with somebody who was telling me that, like, they accomplished something financially. They were very, you know, successful. They were, they, he was explaining to me. And he was, the, the, the numbers he was giving me was enough for him to, I would say, retire. But he says, I can't sleep. More, 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 more. Now, I'm not judging where he is placing his desire for more. If you don't have any walls in front of you, like you're not fighting for anything. What? You're missing out on the most important part of life. Is that you got to keep on fighting. So some people have walls given to them. Some people have walls that they put up themselves. But either way, everyone has a wall that they have to get through to get to the next little bit of our lives. It's normal for you to have a challenge. It's normal for things not to go norm uh, smoothly. That's normal. It's normal to feel like I can't sometimes. Or I can't do this. Or I'm too tired. or I'm. That's, that's part of life. It's normal to feel afraid. It's normal to feel nervous and vulnerable and overwhelmed. That's life. The question is, what do you do with that? And for some people, when they get that feeling, it's they're debilitated. They, 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 they can't get past that. And they get into the world that we've been speaking about of why me or why does this happen for or I can't or I'm going to see into the future and see that there's no way I can figure this out. But all that energy really only is appropriate for what's right in front of your face right now. All the energy that we're talking about, the fear and the, all, all that stuff is just energy waiting to be converted, to be honed into knocking down the wall that's in front of you just for the next few minutes, just for the next day. Where we left off yesterday was this concept that for many people, not for everybody, but for many people, the way we get through it is we're given a choice, which is to actually do the work, which is hard. Usually it's unappreciated. Usually it doesn't have any real immediate outcome. You don't like, you know, make a phone call to the, you don't have the conversation. You don't, you know, do the right thing many times and have, you know, you go home and there are balloons waiting for you. Lots of times in life you do the right thing and nobody knows. You give somebody else the credit. You empower somebody else and they give the, they give that to, you know, to another person. This is like a big thing when it comes to like, I remember when I was young, it took me a long time to understand this when I was young and friends of mine were all getting married and you'd like, you know, be home for 18 years of your life. Then you'd go away for a year to some school or yeshiva or something. And you'd get inspired by a local, by a rabbi there which is fine and wonderful. You come home and then like at your ufru for your parties before your wedding, you'd be like thanking people. And you're like, mom and dad, thanks to my rabbi. You saved me. You changed me. You are me. And like, you'd sit in the room and you'd be like, wait, the mom and dad get 30 seconds. And the rabbi who you met six months ago gets four minutes of just right. Like, how did that work? And you'll see mom and dad just like nodding. It's okay. It's okay. You just be healthy and well. Don't worry about it. 
Many times in life, you build somebody up and they don't even know it was you. They don't even appreciate it. They weren't even with you when they were too young to remember how you, you, you gave them that confidence or you gave them the support. They're, they're giving it over to somebody else. But you know. And you don't take the credit for it, but you know. A lot of games that we play every day, that there's no trophies at the end of those things. There's no highlight reel on YouTube for people to watch for years later. No one's putting music behind our lives for the daily battles of being great. The daily stuff you go through to make sure that your career, that you're providing value for your clients or your patients at the next level. Nobody knows that. Nobody really knows how hard you work or how much you care. So when you hit that wall, and you have a choice. Many times the choice is to not go after it, but to live through something else. Or live vicariously through something else. Now, the stuff that we know about is when you have that wall, and as opposed to going through it, you, you numb yourself. That stuff we know about. We're more, and it's, 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 it's new, but, but we're becoming more and more aware of addiction and people that are numbing themselves to challenges. And By the way, it's check. That whole thing. Is check clear? Yes. But what we are less aware of are the ways that we numb ourselves to challenges by living through other things, by living through entertainment that synthetically creates the same challenge and revolution of challenge, the same character that's really us. You know, when you see, and for those of you who study film, I told you I had a brief period of my life where I studied film. It's for another conversation where I wrote my own film years ago and you really study film, you'll see that the greatest filmmakers and storytellers, they're not telling stories about boxers in Philadelphia or hockey players in the Olympics or, you know, uh, heroes that could, you know, see through things and break things or that small person. They're not doing that. What they're telling stories is about you. They're personalizing stories so that somebody can see themselves in the character. When you watch sports, when you watch these things, they become, you become part of it, right? That's why when you go to a game, people scream, we're number one. They don't say you're number one and I'm happy to be here to watch it. They go, we're number one. Now, if you're watching the guy in the bleachers who spent more money than he can afford to come to that game while he's half drunk, screaming, we're number one. And then you're looking at the guy in the field who's making $7 million to play the game. I don't know if they're both number one. Like, I don't know if the guy, I don't know if the, field, the, the player would be like, yeah, totally, bro. Me and you are number one. I don't think they're saying that. But the guy in the bleachers sure believes that because we've identified with it. We're number one. The guys in the field is a piece of me fighting a battle that I want to fight for myself, but I don't know where to fight that battle. It's easier for me to see the battle in a game and to put myself in the player or in the jersey. And that becomes where I get my fix for seeing challenge and overcoming challenge for heartbreak of loss and joy and victory. There's a great stat. This is, I mean, just for those of you who, who are aware of this, again, if you're a sports fan or you're related to a sports fan, you, you'll, you'll, you'll understand this. You know that, just to let you know, do you know that in every city in which there is a final game, in every city in which there's a final game, a Super Bowl, a seventh game, uh, a World Series, the local hospitals are on higher alert the night of that game. In every city, I read this years ago, the protocol of the local hospitals used to be on a higher level of alert. Why? 
Not because there's riots after the game, but because when the team loses, there's a higher a propensity towards heart attacks. People get sick physically if their team loses or wins maybe. And so the hospitals have to be ready for the emotional, then, which then becomes the physical impact of the winning and losses of a game. Because it's we're number one. People are addicted to binging shows. Because why? Because there's a piece of them in that show, in that story. You'll sit with somebody and they're in touch. You, this, try this. You'll sit with people and you can go hours and they will go from show to show. And when you talk about their lives, it's so, that's yeah, fine. There's no depth to their struggle but they're holding in every single character, how they juggle all those characters. It's unbelievable. Why? They're not, they're amazing people. They're caring, loving, strong, phenomenal. They don't want to be great. Of course they want to be great parents. Of course they want to be, of course they want to become successful because when you hit the wall and your mind says, I can't and right underneath you is a little, a little safety net that says, come, come, come live through this. All you do is go, just give me one more second. I'll be right back. And you start to get a fix from this massive world that gives you the fix of greatness without you doing anything. You get to sit on a couch and watch it. You get to sit back and watch it. You don't got to work for this. You get all the pleasure of the synthetic without any of the work for the authentic. It's a drug. You get to feel high without having to actually do the work and getting naturally high through life. It's a synthetic. And we all do it to some extent. And what happens in our brain is we get used to it. As you hit that wall, the brain goes, just, you're exhausted. Head back to your room and click on. It's hard to get through this next assignment. Just look down at the screen. There's plenty of things for you to watch. It's hard for you to go through your day. It's five o'clock. I mean, you know, it's five o'clock. Just watch this on the way home. I'm not doing anything. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not ingesting anything illegal. But what I'm doing is I'm conditioning myself. So that when I hit my walls, I can go to someplace else that will help me feel a little bit. I can microwave the feeling. It's not the roast that comes out of the oven. It's in the microwave. So it's hot for a few seconds, but all I need is a few seconds. And I'll, and I'll get the next hit and the next hit and the next hit. And then I'll be tired. And then the day will be the week, which will be the month, which will be the year, which can you believe the decade went by? Time flies. How did we get so old? And then all of a sudden, all of those little moments that if I put them all together, will have, would have had a tremendous impact on my life. They're just dispersed in little bits of here and there and watching and listening and getting lost in a conversation about somebody else. I just, I disperse my energy across all these little pockets of time that lead me towards nothing. And then I'm too exhausted to muster up the courage to do big things to break down the wall. We can do this for years and never even know it. This is like how thieves work. You ever know how I'll, I'll end with this? And then I'll see you guys on Wednesday with God's help. Do you ever know how like thieves work, how online thieves work, right? How do online thieves work? They steal your information. Then they charge like 45 cents on your credit card at 1 a.m. They want to see if you're paying attention. And they do it for a dollar. They want to track if you actually know what you're spending on. And they suck and they suck and they suck a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there. If you got on the credit card and you get those things, 
you know, but if you're not paying attention to your own expenses, you don't pay attention to a dollar, 45 cents, 25 cents here. And all of a sudden you, one day you're sucked out and they go for the kill. That's how the world works. You're, you have soul, which means you have unlimited energy. You've got challenges, which is the path to your, to your greatness. But your brain or your evil inclination, depending on where you're holding in spiritual education, your brain doesn't want you to do it. So you know what they do? They suck it. They suck it. 10 minutes, a half an hour, one day. And you can enjoy, you can have a good time in life. But you know what I mean. And next thing you know, you wake up one morning and all that comes together. And you just feel like you can't. I mean, all along the way, you could have. And that's our goal. is to realize that we can. And to realize that every emotion we have is for our benefit, to be used, to just get a little bit better today. And to not allow ourselves to be satisfied with the synthetic cheap hits that the market gives us because they want us to give our eyeballs to them. To stay focused on our dreams. To stay focused on our vision. To stay focused on real things. And be willing to do the small things along the way to get it done. All right. If, I can get, if we can get shows in there early next week, we will. We'll let you know. So hopefully maybe we can even get a show in. That'd be amazing. So, you know, we'll let you know. But if not, look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Have an incredible weekend. Shabbat Shalom. And um, let's be greater today. Let's, let's at least see the synthetic hits. So that if, even if we're doing them, we know what they are. All right. Have a great weekend. Looking forward to seeing you next week.